someone's drone nearly crashed into a firefighting helicopter. Drones can seriously damage aircraft. Your drone is not doing anything to help stop these fires. It is a federal crime. If you live in a fire prone area, seeing aircraft drop thousands of gallons of water or fire retardant near flames is probably a familiar sight. But what you might not realize is how complex, dangerous, and highly organized those operations are. Aerial firefighting combines two already high risk environments, wildfire and aviation. Multiple aircraft operate in tight coordination, sometimes with limited visibility and turbulent conditions. And there's a growing threat in the mix, unauthorized drones and general aviation entering the airspace. These intrusions have become increasingly common and incredibly dangerous. Even a small drone in the area can shut down an entire aerial operation. They can damage aircraft or worse. So today, let's talk about the airspace above wildfires. What is it? How does it work? What are a few common misconceptions? And if you're a drone operator or general aviation pilot, what do you need to know to stay out of trouble and avoid putting lives at risk? To explain how this works, we spoke to someone who sees it all from above, Chief Crusoe, a CAL FIRE Battalion Chief and Air Tactical Group Supervisor, also known as an ATGS or Air Attack. He is one of the men and women who orchestrate the fleets of aerial firefighting aircraft working on wildfires. In other words, he has the most important job in aerial firefighting that you've never heard of. So the fire traffic area is how we organize the airspace over, above, and around a wildfire. It's a standard organization that we use across the country, and it tells everyone what the playbook is so everyone knows kind of what to expect as they're coming in. So we'll have specific assignments and, and altitudes for the different aircraft, depending on what role they are playing in the incident. And it's up to the aerial supervisor to coordinate all that. But that fire traffic area allows multiple aircraft coming from multiple different directions to safely engage in a very dynamic situation. In a fire traffic area, the standard plan is the aerial supervisor, the, the air traffic control over that airspace is gonna fly up on top of what we call the staff. So that's my job. I'm not a pilot, I have a pilot that flies the aircraft for me and I'm in the back being air traffic control. So we have multiple radios to communicate with all the different aircraft, to communicate with firefighters on the ground. We're generally at 2,500 feet above the above where the fire is, so basically half a mile up. And then the air tankers are gonna check in at 1,500 feet above the fire. So they'll come in 1,000 feet below us, which gives us vertical separation from each other. We're gonna fly in a right-hand orbit, air attack. The tankers are coming in on a left-hand orbit. And that has to do with the configuration of a lot of the airplanes that are generally doing this, this function. It also allows the air attack to see where everyone is and keep track of all of the, the aircraft in the orbit. Helicopters will come in underneath all that at 500 feet below, above the uh, fire. And then it's the part of the job of the air attack officer to coordinate the tankers and the helicopters to be able to drop the tankers and safely have the helicopters holding out or working in a different part of the fire. 89 final. 89 final, line is clear, clear to drop. As the fire gets more complex and more complicated, there might be additional aircraft going up even above that. If there's a relief air attack coming in over the fire, they're gonna come in higher. If there's a training or training situation, they're gonna be coming up. And then you have media aircraft that are then even above that. And then now we have our intel gathering, map making aircraft that are coming in even higher than that. All crews talk on predetermined radio channels, constantly updating each other on their positions, intentions, and any hazards. Uh, 514 is off White Cloud en route to the Serendipity incident. Got Pilot Plus 7 on board, two hours of fuel. This open line of communication ensures that everyone knows who's where, who's next in line, and when it's safe to make a move. And we have high tension power lines between the fire and the dip where the copters are coming over now. Let me know if you have the hazards. It's like a carefully choreographed dance. If it's a more complex wildfire with more aerial firefighting resources, they may bring in a helicopter coordinator or otherwise known as an HELCO to manage the helicopters on the fire and or a lead plane to guide the large air tankers. These additional layers help manage traffic and reduce risk when the skies get crowded. Two big misperceptions or misunderstandings. Uh, one is that anytime we have 
aerial firefighting going on, anytime we have air tankers and air attacks and helicopters, that there's gonna be a TFR over that fire, and that's just incorrect. When I talk about a TFR, it's a temporary flight restriction, so it's an area where pilots, general aviation, anybody not associated with the incident can't go in there. It takes a few hours to get a, a, a TFR, temporary flight restriction, set up, and there's a lot of approval processes that has to go through, and honestly, most of our fires, uh, we put out in much less time than that. Uh, so by the time the TFR even got established, the fire is out and the aircraft are gone. Second misperception or misunderstanding is that if a TFR or temporary flight restriction has been established over a wildfire area, that all of the aerial firefighting activity is happening inside the confines of that TFR. All of the air tankers are transiting back and forth between the various air tanker bases coming in and out of that fire area. Uh, oftentimes we'll have heli bases or helicopter bases that are established at local airports that are outside of that TFR. Um, and then all the Intel aircraft and, uh, and a variety of aircraft that are coming in and out of that TFR all day long. For pilots that work off a of flight, you can very easily see where the TFRs are by the, by the bright red box. So there's one there. You can click on that. It will tell you the frequencies, how to contact, who to contact if you were to need to get in there. So this is a fire map from a few years ago on the Caldor fire, uh, a few days into the incident. And the purple blue line is the TFR that's been established around this fire. So if you were to look on ForeFlight, that's what it would look like. But outside of this, you'll see several places where there's routes coming in and out from helicopters coming in and out of the helibases, coming in and out of that fire traffic area. And the other thing that I like to point out is probably the most dangerous spot to be around this TFR is close to the TFRs around the outside. Because any traffic that's transiting GA, commercial, anybody that's moving in or out that need to move around that fire traffic area or that TFR to get to their routing are generally by human nature going to cut the corners and be as close to that as they can to continue on their route. And consequently, you're going to end up with a lot of uh, friction, a lot of aircraft around the corners of a TFR. This is a good representation of a small fire in a, on a relatively quiet day. They had down near Columbia Air Attack Base. It was a four acre fire but all these blue and green lines and yellow lines represent firefighting aircraft. And you can see how many trips the air tankers are taking back and forth between the fire and the air tanker base to reload and how much activity. So if you're assuming that all the activities around the fire and not taking into account the transiting back and forth between the air tanker base, you're missing a, a large amount of that air traffic. So my pilot and I had a near miss situation uh, a year ago where an aircraft uh, almost almost had a mid-air collision with us uh, as we were coming over a brand new fire. Oftentimes people feel like they want to come and report the fire. So they'll fly over to see exactly where that is and then convey that information through air traffic control. And that puts uh, our aircraft that are in that same altitudes at, at a really grave risk. In this day and age, there are almost no fires that aren't already known about. We have uh, wildfire detection cameras on over 1200 mountaintops up and down California. My base alone, we go to probably uh, eight or 10 fires a year that are never recalled in or reported by anybody that are all reported off of automated detection. And this is a, a technology that we're investing a lot in. Drones can seriously damage aircraft and even cause them to crash. Flying a drone in the fire traffic area is not only dangerous, but it's illegal. It is a federal crime to interfere with fighting of a wildfire. You could face up to 12 months in prison, and the FAA can also impose a civil fine of $75,000. Drones are a big concern of ours. Over the Eaton and the Palisades fire, which happened last January, we recorded over, over 200 drone incursions. So 200 drones that were flying in an area that was legally not allowable for any drones to fly. And that's what puts our aircraft, our helicopters at risk. A small drone can create a large amount of damage in an aircraft. So most of our aircraft are flying over 100 miles per hour as they fly around that fire. And when something even as small as a small lightweight plastic drone, when it's hit with that amount of speed, can catastrophically cause failure. The FAA is investigating a mid-air collision. Pieces of the drone that struck one of two super scoopers now out of service until Monday at the earliest. The most important thing to know is that if you fly a drone at one of these brush fires, all aerial operations will be shut down. We've had to stop air operations over a fire on a number of fires over the last few years because of someone sighting a drone or a drone incursion in that area. The implications are, are pretty dramatic because at that point we aren't safe to commit firefighters, the pilots, the aircraft down in the lower levels where the drones are or where that area of the fire where the drone was seen. If we have to pull those aircraft off that fire, then we're not supporting the firefighters on the ground and that fire is going to get significantly worse.
And that has been the cause of several fires becoming significantly larger. And the safest thing to do is stay well away, 15 miles away uh, is what our general recommendation is from a wildfire, looking at the smoke, don't necessarily look for a TFR. If the TFR is there, then definitely offset from that. Um, stay away from the corners and the edges of it. But if you see smoke, assume that there is a, a ton of activity going on over around that fire area. If you see a new fire, don't go to where that fire is. Um, you can report it from a distance, but generally you want to stay away from, from any fire, particularly a brand new fire because aircraft are still coming in. If you're in an area where it's under evacuation warning, you should not be flying your drone in that area. If you see someone flying a drone near a fire, that is a critical safety issue that needs to be reported. So I would report it to the nearest law enforcement, nearest any fire resources that are there, or even contact 911. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. This helps us create more content like this and helps get this information out to the public about the FTA and fire traffic areas.